Good afternoon and welcome to this Childhood Trauma Learning Collaborative webinar, welcoming staff, students, and families back to school with compassion with the Director of the School Mental Health Initiative of the New England MHTTC, Dr. Martha Staley, Elementary Dean of Students for Southside and Stafford Elementary Schools, Tanya Bowles, Principal of Maranacook Community High School, Dwayne Conway, and Principal of Maranacook Community Middle School, Kristen Levesque. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Tunxis and Wapinger nations, now known as Bristol, Connecticut, where Tanya is joining us from today. The Wabanaki nation, now known as Redfield, Maine, where Dwayne and Kristen are joining us from today. And the territory of the Wapinger nation, now known as the greater New Haven, Connecticut area, where Martha and I are joining from today. My name is Dana Asby, and I will be your webinar manager and host. Microphones will be muted during the presentation at designated times during the question and answer session. You can use the raise your hand feature to request an open mic. When you are speaking, please be sure to eliminate any background noise. You can also submit questions for Martha, Tanya, Dwayne, or Kristen throughout the presentation using the chat feature. Registration affirms your consent to receive an evaluation follow up link via email and your consent to recording. If you experience any technical issues on today's presentation, please send a private chat message to Ingrid Paget, our technical support manager for today's webinar. Our funding comes from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. The views and opinions expressed in today's webinar are those of the presenters and moderators, not SAMHSA. The Mental Health Technology Transfer Center Network uses person-centered, affirming, respectful, and recovery-oriented language in all activities. During this webinar, please ensure that whenever you are contributing to our discussion via chat or in the question and answer section of our webinar, that you also use language that is strengths-based, healing, and trauma-responsive. We're pleased that you joined our webinar, and I'd like to introduce now Dr. Martha Staley. Martha Staley is a faculty member at the Program for Recovery and Community Health in the Yale School of Medicine Department of Psychiatry and the Director of the School Mental Health Initiative for the New England Mental Health Technology Transfer Center. Martha trained as a secondary English teacher with a PhD in public health, and she has extensive experience in population health and epidemiology, qualitative and mixed methods research design, analysis and evaluation, and community and clinical intervention implementation. Martha, thank you so much for leading this webinar, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Dana, and welcome to all of you joining us for our inaugural event of the 2021-22 school year. We're so pleased that you're here to join us today in this discussion um, about the work that we're doing in our school mental health initiative uh, through the Childhood Trauma Learning Collaborative, and um, to hear the experiences of some of the people with whom we work in that, that work at, in the CTLC. Today, we're going to tell you a little bit about the Childhood Trauma Learning Collaborative. Um, we're also going to tell you about some of the things that uh, our fellows have um, told us that they're doing to welcome students back to the school year. Um, we wanna tell you a little bit about our model uh, for the work that we're doing, and then hear from some of our CTLC fellows about um, in more depth about what they're doing to welcome students and staff in this year. Um, just a little bit of a background about the CTLC. If you're new to our work, we are funded by the Mental Health Technology Transfer Center, as Dana told us about. Um, this is, we are entering our fourth year of that work. In our first year, we worked on building community and creating knowledge dissemination sessions on some key topics related to childhood trauma uh, and school-based mental health. In year two, we talked about more in depth about school culture assessment and did some more deep dive um, into our subject matter uh, through a series of webinars. Last year, um, we really uh, focused on supporting schools students and staff throughout the COVID-19 pandemic um, with uh, mentorship affinity groups, webinar and uh, listening session series, 
our Compassionate Conversations in School series, our work in the Heart Collective, which is about building collaborations between community health providers and school-based mental health. Um, and as I mentioned, we're about to start our fourth year. And so we're really excited about some of the things that we have coming up. So within the CTLC, we have been very privileged to work with educators and school leaders throughout the New England region um, more intensively about the work that they're doing, um, building awareness and skills surround, surrounding being trauma responsive in schools and supporting students and staff. So up on your screen, you see a couple of quotes from our fellows about what they're doing to welcome back their school communities. One of our fellows said, teachers are doing welcome back videos and tours of the classroom for students. Each class will have a peace corner, a toolkit of mindfulness tools, and zones of regulation cards. Teachers are expected to teach the brain hand model and mindfulness practice several times throughout the day. Another fellow uh, reported that they are welcoming students back by hosting a welcome back ice cream social outside. I plan to welcome staff back with a small gift and some icebreaker games that will incorporate how we're all feeling about coming back. Our district is going to have all staff meet in the same location on the first teacher day and have a keynote speaker talking about social emotional learning and the effects of trauma on the brain. Another fellow said that in acknowledging the staff's year and a half of collective trauma, as well as the unknown future of this pandemic, I intend to draw upon the strengths and community that already exists to create social clubs for adults with similar interests, like knitting, hallway golf, which sounds fun, walking, yoga. I'm also going to try to revisit the idea of having staff photos available for reference so that our school community can get to know each other better. With more than 120 staff members, it's difficult to get to know new members as well as members from different departments. I reached out to multiple universities for increased intern opportunities this year. And I'm also going to reestablish a collaboration with a domestic violence agency to come in to do self-esteem building and limit setting with our girls. And I think you can see in these quotes how thoughtfully our fellows and many, many educators around the country are approaching this return to school using a variety of methods to extend a welcome to students and staff to let students and staff know that school is a safe, connect, compassionate and connected place for them to be. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about some of the strategies that we recommend in our work for doing that um, and how you can do that too in your own schools. But we also wanna bring into this discussion since we are talking with our fellows today um, and giving you some tips and thoughts about um, how to welcome students back. We also think it's really important to hear from students themselves. Um, and that's something that we have been bringing more and more into our work and that we are also going to um, be extending throughout this year four of our, our project. Um, and so we want to, wanted to include the, some student voice in this presentation about what students feel that we can do to support youth mental health in schools. And so we have a short video from one of our uh, interns, May Reeves, who's a 10th grader at Concord Carlisle High School in Massachusetts, to tell you a little bit about what she thinks is really important for students as they return to school. Hello, my name is May Leaves, and I am a 10th grader at Concord Carlisle High School. I am a mental health advocate and social justice activist. When we return in the fall, I believe schools and staff should provide families and students with specific mental health resources to best support their needs during this difficult time. I also believe schools should prioritize social emotional learning and help everyone within the community to look at mental health through an all inclusive, compassionate lens. Teaching students and staff to notice the signs of struggling peers can not only help identify those who need support, but build stronger relationships between teachers, students, and families overall. 
Furthermore, I think it would be beneficial if teachers were provided a training program to help them feel more confident with supporting students emotionally in their classrooms. Staff should extend their passion past academics alone and look to engage students in other ways. Social emotional learning is important when we return to school in the fall as it is essential for students to integrate learning academically and interacting with others empathetically. Social emotional learning can teach students to set new goals for themselves and the community, as well as connect with their own identity, which can be difficult for many to do after so long in isolation. Overall, I believe schools should help students and families return in the fall by prioritizing social connections and peer support. And here. And I, I think you can see in, in uh, May's wonderful video how thoughtful and impressive uh, she is personally, but also um, that students themselves are very aware of building these sorts of compassionate and connected practices and the welcome that they're receiving from the teachers and administrators and staff within their buildings and how important that beyond the academics, which we all know are essential in schools, how important those social emotional skills and opportunities to connect on really human levels um, and how valuable students think that is as they're returning to school, um, especially after such a difficult time. And a lot of what May uh, talks about, we have um, built into our compassionate school mental health model, which really is the underpinning and the foundation of all the work we do within our school mental health initiative. And that is taking a really a whole student, a whole person approach to building compassionate school environments and being attentive to the mental health of students and staff. Um, and you can see in this model, which we created with the input and feedback from uh, not only educators, but also community mental health providers and people with lived experience and students, um, you can see that youth in their home community um, and cultural context are really at the center of this model. And surrounding the youth, we have four quadrants um, of support um, to build a compassionate school mental health program. Um, and the first of those quadrants is about prevention. So having schools and systems really think about the causes of trauma, reducing those causes, evaluating systems and holding them accountable, advocating for change and providing holistic whole student resources um, in an equitable way. Our second quadrant is about supporting youth uh, on a more individual and community level. So that's about identifying those students who might be in need, whether that need is already apparent to school systems or whether it's an emerging need, identifying those students and then connecting them with resources, which may uh, include formal clinical supports um, and may also be about connecting them to more natural community-based supports but also about delivering school-wide programming to reduce stigma and to raise awareness and to help further identify and make it easier for kids who might be in, in need or experiencing trauma or a mental health symptom um, to access services. The third quadrant is about developing protective factors. So fostering nurturing adults, um, which is why we're here today to talk about being nurturing adults within the school environment, building compassionate and equitable environments, cultivating a sense of community and connection and welcome. Um, and our fourth quadrant is about building resiliency and promoting resiliency. So increasing a student's sense of agency, increasing the social emotional learning skill set, and also empowering and lifting up the voices of families and schools to help them I both identify and advocate for their own mental health and well-being needs. So that model really informs all of our work and we hope that you will take a look at this model and think about it in the context of welcoming students back to school this year, whether you've already been in school for a couple of weeks or whether you're about to start after Labor Day, now is a wonderful time to really begin building that foundation of connection. 
Um, and I want to tell you about some of the ways that we're doing that within the Mental Health Technology Transfer Center. Um, the MHTTC, which is the acronym for that long name, <laughs> is actually a national um, uh, network of regional centers. Ours in New England is based at the Yale School of Medicine um, and covers all of the New England states. But every um, MHTTC center has its own school mental health initiative. And there are some tremendous resources that are available to people about school mental health, but also about mental health more generally um, in terms of trauma, grief, equity, um, and building resilience. So a couple of the resources that we've decided to highlight here today are um, our National School Mental Health Best Practices Guidance, um, which is a framework for really developing either beginning a school mental health programming uh, program or building up those resources and supporting the systems and programs that are already existing. And we have a variety of webinars, supports, and resources um, available to you. And I, I should just mention that all of our MHTTC resources are free of charge and available to anyone. And we invite you to, um, to check this out on our website and also feel free to share these resources widely, um, even if they're not from New England, there's some great stuff in there. Also within that programming is um, a report that we did in New England about schools this year supporting student and staff mental health. Um, we have a variety of free training resources. Uh, one of those is a new online free course on the Healthy Knowledge platform um, called Classroom Wise, which is about um, developing uh, and training school staff particularly those in the classroom um, who may not have a lot of experience with school mental health or mental health in general, to be to develop their own mental health literacy. And that is a three module, six hour course that anybody can take um, and can be used by any school system, but it really does a great job of helping um, create a, a really good foundation for mental health literacy. And on that same Healthy Knowledge platform, we've created a Cultivating Compassionate School Communities that Respond to Trauma Effectively course, which is a longer course um, of 12 modules that walk school systems and educators through how to think about their own school communities and develop their own um, trauma responsiveness and to learn more about school mental health in a compassionate, equitable, and connected way. So we hope that you will visit our website to learn more about that. And please reach out to us if you have any questions about those resources. Um, so, which brings us to where we are today, which is talking about coming back to school after COVID-19, supporting staff, student, and family mental health. Because as you have seen in our model, we really think that um, any sort of school mental health uh, programming needs to be systemic and comprehensive and holistic, but particularly as we're all coming back to school, um, whatever school looks like and whatever it looks like in the future, there has been a lot of trauma and a lot of um, isolation and um, anxiety about school. And so we think it's even more important to think about these things as we're entering into this, this school year. Next slide. Um, we have developed, and uh, this is available on our website, a back to school after COVID toolkit to help educators um, and school staff and community mental health staff who work um, in child serving systems to think about how they can create safe and compassionate environments for kids. Um, as Dana mentions in the chat, this toolkit is also linked to the, uh, to the image in the slideshow. So when you get the slides, you can check that out. Um, and we have seven principles that we think are really essential for schools and school staff to think of as we are welcoming students back. And uh, I will go through each of these um, individually and give you some tips about how to implement these principles in your work. But the first one is about fostering safety and equity. Um, 
And we think that that's a really important foundation to set for students. So inviting families to share their stories and their cultures, reviewing school policies and protocols with a lens towards equity, increasing equitable access to educational tools. And I wanna say that we see equity as, as a key piece of building compassionate connected and trauma-informed environments. Um, th those things are inextricab inextricably linked. In order to feel safe, students really need to also feel that the in-school environment is equitable. We think it's really important to build meaningful relationships with students on an individual level, as May mentioned. Creating a culture of joy, so finding opportunities to celebrate giving our students factual appropriate information about safety, equity, um, and trauma in ways that they can understand. And that helps, we feel that all of this helps empower students to take care of themselves and to also look out for their peers. So that's our first principle. Uh, the next principle is about building community. So building strong, healthy relationships between staff, students, and families. And we really see staff as, as being inextricably linked in all of these mental health resources. Um, and, and families as well. We see families as key partners in this work. Using positive discipline practices like restorative justice circles or mindful moments actively creating a sense of belonging for all members of your school community um, and doing that partly through emphasizing common purpose and ideals and providing regular opportunities for service and cooperation um, and also providing developmentally appropriate opportunities for students to make their own decisions and have influence um, amongst their peers and including that family voice in how you're approaching this work. Um, our third principle is about working with community partners to support student and staff mental health. We know that schools can't do this alone. You educators have a lot on your plates and a lot to do, and we cannot attend to the well being of our students and ourselves without building collaboration and partnerships, both within and across schools, but also within our communities and other um, helpers in our communities. So we see partnerships between schools and community partners to be really essential in that work. So considering telehealth and having a reentry plan for students who experienced a mental health crisis, creating early warning systems, being prepared and taking a preventive approach to mental health issues within your school system, um, building mental health awareness campaigns and reducing the stigma so that students feel that they can access these resources. Uh, partnering with community organizations for professional development, teaching coping and resiliency skills, weaving the components of your SEL programming also into the curriculum, uh, the academic curriculum, and providing opportunities either before or after school as well. Um, working towards becoming trauma-skilled schools and using trauma-informed screening practices, if that's something that your school is, is working on. Developing a school crisis plan, we have certainly seen in the last two years throughout the epidemic that schools who have an active um, and up-to-date school crisis plan have fared better and school, both students and staff feel more supported with schools who have crisis plans. Implementing a multi-tiered systems of support for students at a variety of, um, of from the whole school population to those who are in most acute need and, and really supporting staff mental health um, because without uh, a staff um, who's attending to their own well being, we can't then also attend to the well being of our students. Our next principle is about acknowledging and addressing grief. And this certainly is a very, very present principle um, as we recognize that many, many students have lost a close family member or parent um, to COVID-19, millions in fact, I can't remember what the most up-to-date statistics are, but there, many schools have also lost um, educators or students in the course of this pandemic. 
um, to a variety of, of really difficult tragedies. So talking to staff about how to recognize grief, understanding that the grief in children may look different than that of adults um, and may include regressive behaviors or withdrawal or anxiety or complaining a lot about headaches or stomach aches, um, sleep or eating disturbances, all of those warning signs that we know are really important for us to attend to, particularly as those of us in schools are spending a lot of time with students. And providing space and time to talk about loss, acknowledging um, a, a really widespread grief that we have all had for a variety of reasons, from losing out on opportunities to being isolated to losing loved ones close to us, and providing options for those who don't want to talk, other ways to express um, grieving processes. Our next principle is about reestablishing routine and connection. So we know that there's safety in a routine, that getting back into a routine, um, as well as being a, a wonderful thing for those of us who are parents, we look forward to the routine that school gives us. Um, it's a really important way to build in connection and to promote safety. It helps uh, children to feel safe in processing intense feelings and moving through grief. And while some students will be returning to a familiar place, others may be going to a new school or new classroom when schools reopen. Teachers, administrators, and other staff can assist with these transitions by providing space to acknowledge what has happened whenever possible. That's really, really important. Um, our next principle is about using mindfulness to teach self-regulation at home and at school. And we really see this as a, um, a, these are skills that we can use within schools, but also that families can also benefit from. Um, and there's a lot of evidence uh, that supports the use of mindfulness within schools and with children to help them regulate their own emotions, to be um, cognizant of their emotions, and to develop skills to support their own well being. So that's about being present and um, having quality time together, learning to uh, be calm um, through breath work or yoga, meditation. Um, it's about building compassion. So extending compassion to others within your environment who may be um, experiencing some of this grief or trauma, um, modeling it in your own life and with your own staff, but also um, encouraging it within your students. Um, encouraging gratitude, which we know is a powerful way to uh, begin to heal and build resilience in ourselves and students. And finding time to reflect, um, recognizing and processing difficult emotions, and having the space and time to reflect in multiple ways, whether it's talking, whether it's through art or movement of some kind or creating. Um, in ways. It's really important for all of us to have the space to reflect on what we've been through. It's also important for us to begin to build a fusion, a, a vision for a better future together. We have to be able to hold out that hope and optimism that things will be okay and that things will get better and that there is reason to be hopeful. Um, and that there's something that we're all working towards. And that has been really important throughout the last two years, particularly, that there's a time when we can be together and celebrate and be connected. Um, and in this quote, you see, school leaders must invite as many voices as possible into the process of creating that vision and carrying it out, including but not limited to students, families, teachers, paraprofessionals, other support staff, mental health agencies, uh, community organizations, government entities, and any other relevant stakeholders. It's important to form a vision steering team and develop a, a process to develop a vision for your school, to identify people um, to come into the visioning process, to develop a first draft and research other schools or systems that are doing things that you would like to also do and different choices and options for your system, engaging in extended research 
to synthesize your knowledge, calling in experts if you need to, um, if there are particular policies or visions that you're trying to create for your environment, refining it, developing a mission and goal statements, and developing an action plan. And all of these things sort of coalesce around the idea um, of building your community together. And, and this principle really brings together all of our other uh, principles that I just mentioned um, that are included in our back to school toolkit. Um, it's a way to really move forward into the future with some hope and optimism. Next slide. So today we are very, very lucky to have two of our CTLC fellows um, with us, Dwayne Conway and Kristen Levesque um, from Marin Cook uh, Community High and Middle Schools in Maine. Is that, did I say that right? Well, the, I thought it was Marana Cook. Yeah, Mar Marana Cook, but you were so oh, close. I was so close. We're just missing an A in there. So forgive me for that. Um, but Dwayne and Kristen are going to talk to us today about how they are approaching their work. Um, and we really appreciate you taking time out of what I know are very, very busy schedules, leading schools um, to tell us about the work that you're doing. So I'm gonna turn it over to you. Awesome, I'll, I'll jump in and I know Kristen will have uh, more to say and um, do a better job than I do. Um, I think, you know, for both of us, our schools and our community um, is really supportive of SEL um, and um, just being a, a community school, looking after each other, looking after our students. Um, that's something that we've always really valued. I, you know, I think both of us as individuals um, and we appreciate the emphasis our school and district and community puts on it. Um, we have different ways to support students that we have listed there, um, probably for each of us, and you know, Kristen will add in, but the advisory program is, is just the foundation of our individual schools. Um, it's kind of what we build off of. Um, we spend a ton of time uh, in advisory, making sure students have a connection with a trusted adult um, on a daily basis. Um, but also that the district puts a lot of effort and money into it, which is uh, super awesome. We start the school year off um, as a combined 612 campus um, with a day of training and support um, and just getting ready to build those positive relationships. Um, so that's a, a big part of our support for students. Did you wanna jump in, Kristen? Yeah, I think I think that was a great start to it. I think um, Dwayne talked about it quite a bit. Our advisory program is huge, and it really is a six twelve program. While we do some things individual, six eight, and then uh, nine twelve, but we start off our all staff day. First day is uh, just an advisor training day, um, and it's a nice way to kind of remember what we're there for. Um, our district mission, the start of it, is a caring school, and I know. Um, regularly in different speeches and things that we do, we really go back to that, that idea of being a caring school. And I know um, so many places are, are like that. Um, I know the middle school, one of the things that we take pride in is that we're a touchy feely school um, where your relationship with the kids come first and then you see it in the scores um, and kids work ethic and things like that. Um, because we know when kids feel connected, they, um, want to work, you know, they, they work for those relationships, just like adults do. If we feel connected at work, we're going to work more for that, for that position. Um, and I know the high school is, is the same way. It's a very supportive place. Um, it's such a, a little thing, but I, you know, we had talked about it before, but we have welcome signs that go out. And even last year when we were remote a lot, it, we'd put out welcome signs, just welcoming the kids back. And it doesn't sound like a major thing. It you know it doesn't cost a ton of money to get those signs, but we hang them outside our building, um, and they stay up for a little bit. And it's it's just about remembering that they belong here. You know, sometimes kids don't feel like they belong anywhere, but they do belong in their school, and we do notice them. And I think um, I think a lot of people feel that way wherever they work, and it's just about making sure that we communicate it as well. 
I think that's something um, you and I have talked about a lot and really focus on is, you know, having students, having teachers, having the community feel like they belong and matter at our schools. Um, and we just super believe in that. Also on, on here, and it could fit anywhere in the presentation, we're really fortunate to have pretty active PTOs at both schools that um, help out um, in various means and planning events, uh, helping to raise money, um, helping to support students, teachers, and you know, really beyond teachers. We have so many staff members in our buildings that um, support our students. Um, um, so for uh, teachers returning to Moran and Cook and, and just um, the whole team, whether it's, you know, health center, food service, custodians, um, the list goes on and on. Um, we, we do uh, involve most of those people or all those people, if they want to be in the advisor training, we encourage any adult in the building um, to be an advisor or a co-advisor um, in our trainings and in our our general activities, staff meetings, you know, whatever they may be, we typically have a wellness time built in um, with different activities where people can um, choose with their feet uh, how they want to take care of themselves. Um, Kristen's work to have a walking club that uh, we talked about years ago at the middle school, and we we have a club here at the high school that's a little little different, but it's uh, physical health is is a priority for um, our community. Um, we have a lot of campus-wide gatherings, uh, which at times has been awkward, but we've, you know, we've fought through it and um, still tried to be um, a campus while also being individual schools um, and having our own unique aspects. Um, anything else with that, Kristen? Um, yeah, and I think I think we have a unique situation, but I because we are we're a campus school so the middle schools it's separate building and then the high school's right next to it and it's a separate building um, but i don't think it necessarily even matters in the district um, i think in almost any district you go to or at least that i know of there's some tension between the elementary schools and the middle school and sometimes there's like middle school blaming elementary school for different things um, like for kids not being prepared and then same thing high school to middle school and there's always some of that tension and I would just say like that you know we're not immune to that um, and one of the things that has been really nice here and it, it just speaking for Dwayne and I is that we've had those tough conversations and we've had them um, frequently and um, gotten really good at having them but then to have them in order to make things better and I would say the the support that teachers have for each other, 612 has just grown exponentially in the past couple of years. Um, and it's really just from having those honest conversations and, and realizing that we're all here for the kids. And um, there's, a, there's a student at the high school who's you know, super ill right now. And um, just remembering that we all, she's, you know, that person's always all of our kids. And um, Dwayne's done a really good job of connecting us all to, to support our whole community um, and seeing us as one community versus the middle school's a community, the high school's a community, and then the elementary school's our community. We're all one. Um, so really I, love, I love thinking <laughs> about the tough conversations we've had. Um, we've been blessed with many tough conversations and you know, probably to be honest, Kristen and I have had a lot of tough conversations trying to um, support each other uh, while also um, supporting everyone in our building and you know, they have different needs. So it's been a been an interesting process that we've tried to navigate and put a lot of effort into. Um, the community updates were both pretty active uh, with social media and sending out newsletters and supporting our teachers and doing that. Um, I think Kristen does a, a great job with that. Um, with the welcome back videos, the virtual tours, the virtual open houses, um, we really put a put a big focus on communicating. Um, sometimes it, it, I think, for people receiving it, it, it may seem like like a lot to take in, um, but we try to make sure um, everybody knows what's going on in our schools, um, and we really work hard to to celebrate um, 
positive aspects and um, you know address things that that we think we need to improve on. Yeah, I think I think that was pretty good. I think um, for me, when I was thinking about this one, I felt like it was hard to do for whatever reason, but I think it's because we try. I think the big thing is the word community and then communication. Um, so we try, I think we're pretty transparent as a campus. Um, so there's no secret. I, I, you know, I know for me and I, I, I feel it's the same for Dwayne, like there's no secret agenda that we're trying to put out or that we tell staff and we don't tell the community where like we really try and live and breathe being a caring school community um, and making sure that that's clear and transparent to everyone in our district. But I know sometimes that's hard with, you know, with struggles that we've got, but we just have to go back to that all the time. Yeah, it's super hard. And I think, um, you know, one of the obstacles we face that, you know, many, every school faces is sometimes we don't feel, um, you know, may interpret a situation that, um, or a decision that we feel isn't, isn't big um, and maybe doesn't need to be communicated. Um, but sometimes we get in that, that trap of it's going to be important to someone um, and not communicating it. But we uh, really work hard to get the word out. Thank you so much for um, sharing how you start to work together. And I think you two are a really um, amazing model of the power of collaborating with colleagues to build that kind of community. Um, I'm going to introduce you now to Tanya Bowles, who is the Elementary Dean of Students for Southside and Stafford Elementary Schools to tell us a little bit about how um, she welcomes students. And then uh, hopefully we'll have some time for some questions and answers after that. Tanya? Good afternoon, TGIF. Thank goodness it is Friday. So, and it's a busy Friday, first week of school, and our kids are so happy to be here. They want to just explore all parts of the building. So, um, I want to start by saying preparing for this school year kind of began at the end of last school year. We put a lot of things in place. Um, especially with kindergarten. We had our kindergarten orientation at the end of last school year and we did a presentation. Our students were able to, and parents were able to um, see uh, the kindergarten teachers, kind of take virtual tours of their, of their classrooms, kind of update them on what the school year would look like. And the classroom teacher, teachers, uh, especially kindergarten, once they got their class list, they were connecting with families throughout the summer. So when there were things that were going on, they were reaching out to families to keep them abreast. Our kindergarten students, we had welcome packets, which had um, our building water bottle with our logo. We had uh, t-shirts, math manipulatives. We had summer packets that the parents could work on with their students. And um, just, uh, just a lot of little things, uh, branding things for the school to help the parents and the students feel connected and when they came to the building, they were able to already recognize certain things and recognize our, our SOAR expectations. And another thing that we did during the summer, um, we connected with those students who may have struggled the previous year or who were virtual and we had a summer boost program. So two weeks before school started, we had those students come in to just kind of refresh their skills, get familiar with the building, um, if there were kids that struggled with attendance, we really focused on trying to get them in and just get them familiar with the process, um, just academically start to gauge where some of them were to prepare for this upcoming school year. Um, and then some of the things that we just as a district wide, we did, um, we had the book mobile go to all the different schools and we invited our parents to come out. Um, and meet the building administrators and pick a book. A lot of times schools also did things like ice cream socials along um, with that. We, some people did face painting and did arts and crafts um, and things like that to kind of really engage and get to know the families and they can know the staff. Um, 
As a district, um, I think we have a really good presence on social media. So there are a lot of things that we're posting throughout the summer, not just about the school, but just individually as, a, as administrators and teachers who we are. We you know, share about some of our summer um, activities and things that we did and just reaching out to parents and students and saying, hey, won't you share um, some of your summer activities and what you've done? Um, at this, my school today where I'm at, Southside, one of the things we did, which not all schools um, do, we had open house, our first open house before school opened. So we wanted to get parents and children in the building um, before we had any, uh, any negative interactions or anything like that. We wanted to start on a nice personal um, note and we had small sections of parents coming, so they had to sign up. So we had four or five parents at a time go into the classroom. Um, the students were allowed to bring, besides of their mom and dad, maybe one other person, and they were able to sit down and look at their desk and their, um, you know, their nameplate. They were able to just walk around and look at the different things, look at the books, look at the manipulatives, just like get a feel for where their kids were gonna be in the classroom teacher. And we really wanted to develop those relationships immediately and we wanted our parents to feel comfortable and connected um, right off the bat. We didn't want the first day of school to be the day that our kids were walking into the school. So we wanted them to walk the halls and meet the staff and see where they were going um, so that they would feel more comfortable and their parents would feel more at ease. Um, let's see. One of the things that we also did with some of our incoming pre-K students because a lot of them and some of our kindergarten students really didn't have the experience of being in the building. So we had our support staff create a, um, a survey and we send it out to parents asking them who are their children, you know, how do they like to learn, what are their hobbies, um, what are their favorite foods, what were the parents' fears or what were their children's fears. And then we made a point of then connecting with the family over the summer and touching base with them, having them bring the kids in. We did home visits, again, to um, bring t-shirts and books and things like that, but also put a name to the face and be able to spend some time with the kids and let them know these are the people um, other than mommy and daddy that when you come to school who are here to help you. Um, let's see, we did so many different things. Oh, one of the things that's really um great that I didn't have a chance to participate in last year was the day before school, um, the principal sent out, well, before school started, he sent out a survey with four books and he wanted everybody to, um, to pick which book that they wanted him to, to read the night before school. So he gets on Facebook and the night before school, he reads a book. But as a school, we take turns and every month, somebody reads a book over Facebook and the parents um, all log on. We also do um, like bingo and things like that over Facebook for our parents. So that's how we kind of started the year and the things that the parents like and they feel connected with, we just try to continue to um, keep it going. Um, due to COVID, there are some things that we've had to kind of scale back on, but one of the things we were hoping this year we can can bring back is we have a learning day where parents actually come to school and they go into the classroom and they're able to sit with their with their children while the teachers are teaching. And so that way they can learn what's going on. They can learn some of the strategies and they're able to when the children come home with questions, they're familiar with how the teacher are teaching some of the concepts because you know, it's constantly changing in a way that we've done it in the past and how we may ask our children or our grandchildren or show them how to do things. Um, it kind of differs and some of the language are different. So we do have the parents kind of come in and sit in on lessons so they can hear the language and see what the teachers are teaching so that they can support their students at home. Oh, and the other thing, one more thing I forgot. Um, we also have teachers volunteer to do home visits. So it's not just our support staff, but we also have teachers who may have connections with certain families who may have um, struggles or difficulties or anxieties around school. We also have them 
kind of go out during the summer and welcome kids back and um, just getting to know them and having someone that the, that a parent is familiar with kind of talk about what the following school year is going to um, going to look like. Talk about the new teacher and their relationships and just to um, you know make the family feel connected and always have someone to touch a base with until they feel comfortable with the new teacher. And I think that is about it. Thank you so much, Tanya. It sounds like you've um, really been so thoughtful about creating a really um, loving and compassionate environment for your students. And, and I so appreciate the three of you being here and sharing about how you can um, do these things at, at all different levels, right? We have Tanya from elementary and Kristen from middle school and Dwayne from high school. and um, it's just, it's really wonderful and inspiring to hear about some of the strategies that you've used to build those connections. Um, and I, I noticed some common themes um, that you're talking about. I was really struck by Kristen uh, talking about the, the message that you belong here. Um, and, and that's such simple words, right? But such a powerful message. You belong here. We want you here. It's not just you arrived here by accident, but we are thinking about you as people, as individuals. Um, and Tanya, you you spoke in more detail about um, getting to know individual students, what they like, what they need, um, what their families are like. And and Dwayne and Kristen, you you talked about that as well as really building those connections in a very very personal way. Um, and, and I was struck by um, how much all three of you talked about those connections as forming the foundation for all of the other work that is to come throughout the year. Um, and um, I, I have so many questions to ask you and I, I don't know if there are questions um, from the people who are um, joining us on the, the webinar, but please, if you have questions, um, please write them in the chat. Um, uh, that would be great. Um, I want to ask you about like, all the things that you're doing, talking about um, finding support as administrators in leadership, how you find support amongst people in similar positions and build that and what the values are for administrators in your positions to find that peer support. Anybody have thoughts on that? I, I can go just because we talked about it earlier too, but um, I think it's been pretty neat for me. Um, like I said, we're a shared campus, but I think sometimes it, you don't need it, you don't even necessarily need that because oftentimes it's messages or um, emails or phone calls or whatever it might be, but just that support together that, you know, you're in this together. And I know I can rely on Dwayne if I need help with anything, whether, you know, whether I'm just looking for advice or what, what it might be. But I think it's, it's part of building trust and kind of um, giving and taking. Like, I just think those relationships are really important. Um, and finding that person that you, you know, a like position that you can reach out to. Um, and I think it's great when it's within that same district um, because you can really move mountains, I'd say, if, when you have that connection and, you can build on, you know, I know I can build off um, what Dwayne can provide from me and then hopefully vice versa and using our, our teachers and our staff together as well. Um, Craig asks along that line, so the culture you have in your schools sounds great. Has the culture always been this way or did it take time to build and get staff on board? That's a good question for all three of you because I mean, it sounds like any any one of us would be delighted to have our children in, in your schools, was it always that way? Or what was the process of building that? Um, and yeah. David uh, expands on that. Did the impetus to move toward community originate with the leadership or community members or combination? I think for us um, at Miranda Cook, 
the high school was built or is really a middle school high school in like 70, 1976 and it was designated a community school and that was really super emphasized um that was the reason for for building it um so people were super behind that and were fortunate to have that history um Kristen would know better but i think in around 2001 the middle school moved out of that that combined building because um they were they got bigger um and then uh, Miranda Cook Community Middle School was built right next door. Um, so again, it, it came from the community. It's taken constant upkeep, uh, though, and you know, constant support um, from the community. And it, it needs to be a priority, you know, in your strategic, just you know, your district uh, strategic plan and your goals as a as a school and campus. Um, so it's it's a lot of work, but we're super fortunate that we had it there to begin with. Yeah, um, I would say too, like as far as our, the connection between the middle school and the high school, another piece of it is I used to be um, Dwayne's assistant principal. Um, so we had a, like going into it, I, we had a relationship already. Um, so I think that was helpful. Um, but then you had also asked about the culture and the culture is a constant thing. Like it's a constant phenomenon that is just really something that you need to be so sensitive with. And um, I was smiling when, when you're reading that question, um, Dwayne and I both have our doctorates and we both did our doctorates around culture and change and how precious and fragile those are. So it really needs to be the priority. And I think, like I was saying earlier, if you don't have a strong culture, if you don't feel like you belong or the staff belong or the kids belong or whatever it might be, um, people won't you know, people won't bring it, <laughs> you know, um, I think people are willing to sacrifice and put in so much when they feel like they belong and they're a part of something. Um, and I, that's what, you know, that's what, how, what we want, right? We want everyone to feel fulfilled and it's not just about your salary or your title or whatever it is. It's because you belong and you want to, um, you that's a such a power, powerful yeah. reminder that it, it takes constant upkeep and um, being responsive to changes in the culture. We just have a couple minutes left. Tanya, it looked like you wanted to say something about how your culture originated before we end. Um, so I am actually new to the district. I started, I was a school social worker for 17 years and then I transitioned into administration and I started my new position 20 days before the pandemic hit. So, <laughs> um, and coming in and being having something such as that happen, um, I can really say this, this um, focus on developing relationships and engaging and connecting, um, it was there when I started. It was there when I came. And for someone I can really, um, understand how our children and families feel in coming in because I was someone who came in and I can't and coming in at the time that I did that was the really it was really important to feel connected and engaged because everything went online and I really felt supported as an administrator um coming in at that time and then it, it just it just permeates everything that we do here um our superintendent is ex is excellent and she is all about equity and diversity and connecting and developing relationships and knowing the stories of our children and our families so everything that we do is about our children and our families and um wanting them to be the best possible people that they can be and providing opportunities for everyone to access the teaching and learning that is going on. So everything that we do goes back to providing opportunities for our children and our families to be the best possible people that they that they um, that they can be. And it makes it easy to do what it is that we do because it comes from the top and it's supported. And we see that she 
is very thoughtful in the programmings and how money is spent, that that is always the bottom line. It's always about our children. It's always about our families. It's about creating opportunities. It's about creating windows and doors. It's about seeing themselves in the curriculum and then the staff that are around them. So all the other stuff is like easy because she's doing all the heavy lifting and she's making sure we have everything that we need and we just kind of have to take it and, and and tweak it and make it our own well thank you that's a i wish we had more time because it sounds like you have just amazing wisdom to to share with us but i want to thank the three of you so much for being here and sharing your experiences um and thank you to everybody who joined us today i'm going to pass it back to dana to tell us about upcoming events thank you Thank you so much, Martha. Um, we hope you can join our next two Childhood Trauma Learning Collaborative events. Um, on the 16th of September at 10 a.m., we will be talking about how you can use Classroom Wise in your own districts and schools. That'll be a very brief 30-minute information session, and we hope that you will register for that and get the recording if you can't join us at that time. And then on the 14th of October, we'll be introducing our um, healthy knowledge course, Cultivating Compassionate School Communities that Respond to Trauma Effectively Online. We'll be talking to you about how you can use the course over a semester or a school year and invite you to join our technical assistance opportunity around that course. Um, the links to register will be in the slideshow when you get that. We also are required to evaluate our services because our funding does come from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, which requires us to do that. Um, our technical support manager, Ingrid, will put the link to this very brief three question evaluation survey in the chat. You can also use your phone to scan the QR code that's on the screen. Attendees that provided their email address will also receive this survey 24 hours after the close of today's event, along with today's slide presentation. The follow up Email will include links to request CEU credits and or participation certificates. We really do appreciate your honest anonymous feedback, which helps provide information to SAMHSA and assists us in planning future meetings and programs. Your feedback counts. Um, so for more information about CEUs or certificates, contact New England MHTTC at New England at MHTTCnetwork.org. And please also stay posted to our website, um, which is listed on the slide for links to our the video presentation and related slides. And you can also subscribe to our newsletter to learn more about resources to support mental health. You'll also get an invitation to join our base camp team. For any questions about the Childhood Trauma Learning Collaborative, please contact Martha Staley. Uh, you can see her email there. And thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we hope to see you at our next CTLC webinar or on our base camp platform. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the long weekend. Take care of yourselves and each other and be well. Thank you.